Tonight, Trump threatens North Korea, Arizona's banned books, and trans soldiers speak out. I love being in the army. I, this is my life. A landslide triggered by heavy rains has killed at least 24 people in southwestern China. Rescuers have been working to pull people out of the rubble. Everyone else has been evacuated and relocated. The landslide has caused an estimated $23 million in damage. Google has fired James Damore, the employee who wrote a memo criticizing the company's diversity policies. The software engineer says he was wrongfully terminated for, quote, perpetuating gender stereotypes. In his 10-page document, Damore says women are more neurotic and that gender differences may explain the lack of women in leadership roles. After Damore was fired, one Google employee told Vice News, I wanted this to happen since Friday. Purge the rest of the white weirdos while you're at it. Airbnb has deactivated the accounts of people using its service for the Unite the Right rally this weekend at Emancipation Park, which was Robert E. Lee Park until February. In a statement, the company said it would remove people from its platform when their behavior is, quote, antithetical to Airbnb's user agreement, which prohibits discrimination. Jason Kessler, the rally's organizer, tweeted, it's time for the alt-right to flex its muscles and boycott Airbnb. Also need to consider a lawsuit. The Department of Justice has switched sides in a landmark voting rights case in which it is neither a plaintiff nor a defendant. The department is throwing its support behind Ohio's right to purge inactive voters from its roles. Civil rights groups say the policy functions as a voter suppression tool. The Supreme Court is set to hear the case next term. This follows a pattern. In February, the DOJ dropped its support for an Obama-era challenge to Texas's strict voter ID law, which a federal judge has ruled is discriminatory. In an exclusive, three current and former administration officials told Vice News that a package known internally by some as the propaganda document is prepared and presented to the president twice a day and contains printouts of positive news stories, cable TV graphics, tweets, and sometimes just pictures of Trump looking powerful on television. This morning, former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer disputed the descriptions of the folder and said, quote, this is not accurate on several levels, but he didn't respond when asked what exactly was inaccurate. According to a report in the Washington Post, the Defense Intelligence Agency has concluded that North Korea is now capable of making a small nuclear weapon that can fit inside its intercontinental missiles. Experts concluded that those missiles are capable of hitting the east coast of the United States, meaning the world's most belligerent rogue state is on the verge of becoming a serious nuclear threat. And North Korea has now threatened to use all its resources to physically retaliate against the latest round of UN sanctions. It's the strongest suggestion yet that the regime could conduct another nuclear or missile test. Pyongyang likened the sanctions to a, quote, pack of wolves coming in attack to strangle a nation. President Trump didn't take the news quietly. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. To contrast just how different this response is, here's how Barack Obama responded following a North Korean nuclear test. Provocations of the sort we saw last night will only further isolate them. As we stand by our allies, strengthen our own missile defense, and lead the world in taking firm action in response to these threats. And here's George W. Bush. The United States remains committed to diplomacy, and we will continue to protect ourselves and our interests. So how will North Korea reply to Trump's response? We spoke with two experts about what's probably going on in the country right now. An issue of this nature probably would be dealt with through the, the National Military Commission, which uh, used to consist of the most senior military officials, roughly about eight, and the, uh, the leader of the country, in this case, Kim Jong-un. 
Uh, I imagine here um, uh, Kim Jong-un would be personally involved, as he has been, uh, with these ballistic missile launches and nuclear tests. This is a punch that's been telegraphed for many, many years now. So in that sense, their intentions are very, very clear. And, um, and again, we, uh, we ignore them or uh, downplay them at our own peril. Trying to north, out North Korean the North Koreans is never going to work. And so if that's what uh, President Trump was intending through his words today, um, which had a little bit of a ring of, of North Korea's own uh, threats, um, you know, I, I don't think that that's uh, possible, nor do I think that's um, the place that the United States of America should ever be occupying as a, a global leader. The July tweet storm from President Trump announcing a ban on transgender people in the military, which would reverse the historic 2016 decision to allow them to serve openly, has wreaked havoc across the armed services. The military establishment wasn't consulted, and the Department of Defense had no policy response. And for thousands of trans troops, the lives they've dedicated to serving their country now hang in the balance. I found out about maybe 15 minutes before morning formation. I was already at work. This is Katie Schmid and her wife, Lulu. And Wednesdays are run days, so I went running. Um, if I recall, you told me you were running out of spite, <laughs> purely yes. on spite. And then Katie got home and there was shouting and crying and and wall punching and... I didn't, I didn't punch any walls. I didn't say you did. <laughs> <laughs> it was very emotional. Schmidt enlisted in the army in 2005 in intelligence and as a man. The whole idea of like swearing to support and defend the Constitution and stuff like that really resonated with me. And I know it's, it's pretty stereotypical, I guess. But... Uh, yeah, I thought, I thought the army would make a man out of me. After completing specialty training, she was stationed in Germany, then moved to Fort Riley, Kansas. She was made a non-commissioned officer in 2009 and staff sergeant in 2012. Once I became an NCO, started getting these. Well, these are NCOERs, or non-commissioned officer evaluation reports. And uh, of course, it's got my old name on it. Started getting comments from my raiders saying things like, committed to the goals and mission of the unit above personal welfare, dedicated and absolutely loyal, unlimited potential. Are you proud? (laughs) Absolutely. I'm, but I'm not just proud of myself. I don't, I'm not doing it for myself. I'm not doing it for getting a a piece of paper that says, you done good. Um, I'm I'm doing it because because I love being in the army. I this is my life and it has been for over a decade. When she came home from Iraq in 2013, Katie knew she was trans. She was diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which could have gotten her kicked out. To preempt that, she wrote a memo to her superiors. I offered them a deal. I said, "I promise you that I will not take any steps towards my transition unless and until specifically authorized by the Department of Defense. The mission comes first and my medical care can take a back seat. Just don't kick me out of the army. (laughs) Do you think if you didn't have a record like this, it would have been harder for you to transition in the army? Absolutely. Um, That was the single deciding factor of not being kicked out back in 2014. It felt like it had finally been proven true what the Army always said, which was you're not going to be judged for who you are, only how you perform. In June 2016, after a lengthy review, the Department of Defense announced that trans service members would be allowed to serve openly. Effective immediately, transgender Americans may serve openly and they can no longer be discharged or otherwise separated from the military just for being transgender. I had been waiting, not just since I'd come out, but it felt the same way as when I got told by my commander back in 2014 that 
you can stay in based on your merit, your gender takes a back seat. But Trump's tweet has thrown all of Schmidt's accomplishments into question. While we were in Tacoma, she planned to meet up with other trans service members in the area to talk about their experiences after the tweet and what comes next. My uh, squad leader texted me, he's like, uh, you know, this was put out, and I was like, okay, we're not gonna freak out because it's not what we do. We're soldiers, we're, we're, we're members of the military. We suck it up and drive on until something happens. My whole military career and future kind of somewhat flashed before my eyes because the military has been my life since I was a little kid. When you have your whole, you know, next 13 to 23 years planned out one specific way and somebody brings up something that could potentially ruin that, it's nerve-wracking and a little heartbreaking. There's no policy yet. What if there was? What do you think you would do? There are so many what-ifs for that yeah. question, though. You know, it depends on what does that policy say? What does it entail? Does it, does it entail a grandfather clause for those of us who are already here? Yeah. Even if it did include that, we're still gonna sit here and, you know, for our brothers and sisters that come behind us who still wanna serve their country because they're able-bodied and should be able to serve their country, you know, it's gonna affect them. The fight doesn't stop with us. We all know exactly what we need to do. And it's not just a, okay, here's what I feel inside versus here's what I express outwardly. Um, a soldier isn't something you do, a soldier is someone you are. When she was last in the national news, Congressman Debbie Wasserman Schultz was stepping down from her job as chair of the Democratic National Committee after WikiLeaks released a series of embarrassing emails. Now Schultz has a new self-inflicted problem. Shauna Thomas has more. Back in February, a U.S. Capitol Police investigation into a House of Representatives IT staffer named Imran Awan became public. Awan's access to the House IT network was blocked, and most members of Congress fired the contractor. But Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, former head of the Democratic National Committee, didn't. The question of why Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz continued to employ Imran Awan as a tech consultant when he wasn't allowed to have access to the House network isn't going away. Wasserman Schultz's office told us Awan's job was narrowed after the investigation was announced. But as the right-leaning Foundation for Accountability and Civic Trust has pointed out to the Office of Congressional Ethics, it's worth asking what exactly was he doing in this job then and why taxpayers were paying for it. Wasserman Schultz's office disagrees, and in a statement called the complaint, quote, entirely baseless. Rob Walker, a lawyer who used to work for both the House and Senate Ethics Committees, said she should get out ahead of any formal investigation. I think she's made her case publicly uh, and explained publicly that why she kept him on or how it was she thought she was, it was appropriate to keep him on and the circumstances. If she were my client, I would advise her to put that same information in a letter to the Office of Congressional Ethics and say, here's why this complaint does not have merit. Now, there are already leaked emails that show the access Awan had to the Congresswoman's devices. But if an investigation were to dive into her emails further, it could show coordination between staffers at the DNC and her House office that walks the line of appropriateness. This kind of fuzziness is normal in D.C., but Republicans have been playing scandal zone defense since Trump's inauguration, and they're eager to play offense. Republican Representative Ron DeSantis of Florida sent a letter to the Department of Justice last week asking about the nature of the investigation into Awan and suggested Wasserman Schultz might need to explain herself in a more formal setting. In the House of Representatives, we have to investigate how our systems may have been compromised, and that will require putting people in the chair. Multiple former staffers I talked to said they always thought Awan was kind of shady, but that talk of terrorism, which DeSantis suggested in his letter, seemed far-fetched to them. They also admit that Wasserman Schultz has a way of making things worse for herself. In an interview with the Florida newspaper, the congresswoman defended her decision to keep Awan on, saying that she had concerns about due process and, quote, racial and ethnic profiling. But even that explanation has political problems. Awan only worked for Democrats, so she's basically implying that fellow Democrats who fired him months ago may have done it for racist reasons. Republicans already have it out for her, and it's hard to expect allies if you're calling them racist. Ever 
Ethnic studies programs have become an uncontroversial fixture of school curriculums across America. But in Tucson, one such program has been a political flashpoint for years, pitting Mexican-American students against conservative lawmakers. A federal court ruling expected in the next few days will decide whether an Arizona law banning that program is unconstitutional. Tucson's Mexican-American Studies program was founded in 1998 and made Mexican-American literature and history classes part of the core curriculum as a way to improve student engagement in a district that's over 60% Hispanic. We asked the students to be critical. We looked at Mayan Aztec history and we shared with students some of the alternative perspectives. At its height, one in five Tucson students in participating schools was taking an MAS course, and they saw a significant boost in standardized test scores. We saw people that weren't the, the typical A-plus students and that were just like really engaged in this class. Many conservatives, though, saw the program as a Trojan horse, designed to allow radical teachers to smuggle anti-American, anti-white sentiments into the state schools. What I'm criticizing is a program in the high schools that, that I believe is openly racist. One of the leading forces against the program was a state senator named John Hoopenthal. The catalyst for his crusade was a visit he made to an MAS classroom in 2010, where he talked to students about the anxieties many white Arizonans felt. I'll be straightforward with you. There's this feeling of threat by a lot of people that their cultural traditions that they felt resulted in the most prosperous, free nation in the world, they feel, they feel <clears throat> under threat that those cultural traditions are at risk of being washed away. Personally, I don't feel disassociated from this country just because of my ethnicity. If you write an essay on people that are historically oppressed and he'll say like, okay, you, you understand what these people are going through, you understand what the concept is, now how can we change it? You know, I started thinking, you know, I'm a Chicana, I ain't gonna be able to graduate, I'm gonna have kids young, I'm a, you know, like that. And then I started coming to these classes and I started seeing like, why am I believing all this? Instead of believing it, I should change it. I just had a really great philosophical problem with that whole construct that they were using that this oppressed oppressor framework has some kind of foundation in reality and that it's useful, I think it's totally worthless. I think it's less than worthless. I think it's toxic. So amidst growing anti-immigrant sentiment, legislators passed a bill to kill the program. The law prohibits courses that promote resentment toward a race or class, are designed for a particular ethnic group, or advocate ethnic solidarity instead of individuality. Hoopenthal became superintendent of Arizona's schools soon after, running on a campaign to quote, stop La Raza, and he wasted no time shutting the program down. Our education's under attack! What do we do? Fight! How do I tell my kids that the institution of education respects them for who they are if it doesn't even teach them about who they are? Teachers and students immediately sued the state, charging the law was discriminatory. And now, after years of working its way through the courts, a decision is finally due. But the law has already had a lasting impact. While ethnic studies programs are expanding across the nation, Tucson schools have been left paralyzed. There's misinformation out there that you can't teach anything to do with Mexican-American culture because of the ban on our program, which is just an absolute falsehood. But teachers think that's true. Districts think that's true. And it becomes this, like, unwritten policy. And that's scary. A decision in favor of the program could change that. But some Tucsonans have already taken matters into their own hands. So this is our underground band book library. We've been protecting it for many years now. We were in Curtis Acosta's class when they walked in with boxes and they actually started taking some of the books. And that was the point where a lot of my classmates were like, this is it. When are we ever going to see these again? 
they said, no, we're not going to let our books get taken. We're, this is our identity. We're not going to let it be boxed up. And uh, they packed these books away in their little backpacks that turned big and heavy. This is history. It's, it's not fake. It's not made up. Like, I know they always talk about us hating the white man and like bloodshed and all that, but that's not what I felt when I read these books. I see people that look like me, like my parents, like my grandparents. I know we went through unfair things, but it doesn't make me hate anybody. It makes me love myself. I would love for the day that we can return these books and uh, they can be taught in the classroom again to our children. Until then, they're here and we're protecting them and taking care of them. like pure baby making music. <laughs> I feel like I constantly ask myself, are you waiting on someone else? Because I'm like, you're definitely not waiting for me. <laughs> it's literally my life. I love but the with, intro vocals. with the timbales in the yeah. back, so you're kind of like into it. Yeah, when there's like bossing going on. Yeah, you can't have a sad song with timbales. Timbales? Timbales? <laughs> just said timbales. Danielle. <laughs> you can't say timbales. Okay. <laughs> it's timbales. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Interesting choice. Hello. Show tonight. Oh gosh. Woo. Mm. I'm feeling really uncomfortable listening Woo. to this song with my sisters next to me. It is it's getting hot. Very hot. Thanks. I mean, what kind of mood do you think we're in after hearing that song? You got song? a cigarette? Wow. I mean, it was buttery and yeah, beautiful. Buttery for sure. Literally evoked so much emotion out of me. Her voice is insane it's that was the Buttery. most beautiful that and that song is might be again, my favorite again. song again. that's vice news tonight for tuesday august 8th 